I'm just going to give it a couple minutes for people to um, file in, and then we can start in, in, a, in a minute or so. For those of you who are joining us, we will be starting soon. Okay, I think we can begin. You can begin whenever you're ready. Okay. So, um, welcome everybody. My name is Franklin Odo. I'm moderating uh, tonight's uh, discussion with our author, Gail Okawa. Um, who wrote this very interesting book called Remembering Our Godfather's, Grandfather's Exile. And we have her um, <clears throat> on the show this evening and we'll run for close to an hour, I think. Um, so it's a pleasure to welcome you, Gail. Um, uh, good evening in, in, on the East Coast and good afternoon in Hawaii. Uh, Greetings from the, West, from the Rust Belt. <laughs> yes, you're from the Rust Belt. <laughs> are you are you calling in from Hawaii? Are you Ohio? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. Well, we I think we have a a, a nice audience um, this afternoon, so hopefully we'll um, have an entertaining uh, session for for everyone. So tell me um, first uh, how you got started on this project. It was well, it was such an interesting read. Well, thank you. But let me um, first. I'd like to. Um, thank Roger and his uh, Hoi Book and Music Festival staff. Also, uh, Craig Howes and his folks, um, uh, UH Press, uh, the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii Volunteers and Translators, uh, Franklin and your staff many years ago at the Smithsonian, um, and really all the families, uh, friends and relatives who have been supporting me on this project for 18 years. Um, it's, it's a real commu community effort. So I wanted to thank everyone for their support. Oh, okay. Nice. Okay, all right. So tell us how you got, you, you, you've had, um, later on, I want you to talk a little bit about your career, but, but let's start with um, how, you, how this happened in the first place. Okay, well, um, there were open questions in our family history. Um, I learned in high school by chance from a neighbor that um, our grandfather was in prison during World War II in a concentration camp on the mainland. Um, so when I ran home to question my parents, they only said, yes, he came back a changed man. And that's the kind of a, a ph phenomenal revelation to learn in high school. Well, it was phenomenal because we had been studying um, history, you know, American history, and um, uh, I had probably been learning about the uh, West Coast uh, so called evacuation, the <clears throat> apprehension of everyone on the West Coast and the movement in, inland. Um, and I was probably just talking about it. I don't remember the exact circumstances, except that this neighbor mentioned that grandpa, my grandfather was sent away. So that's why I ran home to, to ask my parents, but you know, I was a kid and that's all they said. And I realized that <laughs> I probably wasn't supposed to be asking too many more questions. So that was kind of the end of that. Um, and then in, my, in the 1990s, so many years later, decades later, um, my mother shared letters um, 
that with New Mexico uh, return addresses on them. And, um, and then I found one photo, which I'll show in a, uh, when we get into the PowerPoint. I found one photo, which was very puzzling because it wasn't labeled. Um, so there were these latent questions, you know, why, how, where uh, was he interned? Um, but then academic training that I had received, and I think many of us received back in the day, so to speak, um, said we weren't supposed to be looking into personal histories and, you know, personal things. And... Um, so I thought it was pretty much off limits, but by 2001, when I was thinking about a sabbatical, my colleagues uh, encouraged me. They were, things had changed in, um, I, in the academic world, I think sufficiently that I was being encouraged to um, pursue something that was that personal. So, um, I did. I, I started, this was in the English department, and I started writing my proposal, and then 9-11 happened. Um, I, you know, I was right in the middle of, propose, of preparing this, and 9-11 um, <clears throat> happened. We had a second attack on the so-called homeland, and um, a similar treatment of minority group. Um, so this really propelled me into the research in a way that, you know, I may not have been propelled quite in the same way had it had there not been a catastrophe like that. Um, and then a year later, I was just starting on this project because I'd gotten my sabbatical proposal accepted. And um, I was invited to the dedication of the Santa Fe internment camp historical marker. So I flew to Santa Fe from Washington, DC, which is when I was uh, working with you at the Smithsonian. Um, and I, I'd like to share some slides at this point, if it's okay. Sure. Um, let me see if I can manage the technology. Looks good. <laughs> Okay, so this was the um, historical marker that was established after a great deal of controversy. Um, that's another story. Um, but I, I actually found that um, it was a life-changing experience for me to go to this dedication. Um, first, I'd like to just read the wording on the marker because that was one thing that really struck me. This is um, right, if, I don't know if you can see it, but it's basically the wording right here on the plaque. It says, at this site, due east and below the hill, 4,555 men of Japanese ancestry were incarcerated in a Department of Justice internment camp from March 1942 to April 1940, 1946. Most were excluded by law from becoming United States citizens and were removed primarily from the West Coast and Hawaii. During World War II, their loyalty to the United States was questioned. Many of the men held here without due process were longtime resident, resi religious leaders businessmen, teachers, fishermen, farmers, and others. No person of Japanese ancestry in the US was ever charged or convicted of espionage throughout the course of the war. Many of the internees had relatives who served with distinction in the American armed forces in Europe and in the Pacific. This marker is placed here as a reminder that history is a valuable teacher only if we do not forget our past. So with this and the event that, that accompanied it, the dedication and the, um, uh, the luncheon that followed, 
I saw that there were hundreds of internees and this really helped me realize the importance of the research to real families uh, in our community. So this was not simply an academic project as I understood it from this experience. Ah, excellent. That, that, that plaque, the reading, the, the um, writing on the plaque is uh, a good summary of what happened. So about 120,000 persons of Japanese ancestry were incarcerated during World War II from um, Hawaii and, and the continent. Um, but mass incarceration, the mass removal uh, of um, Japanese Americans did not take place in Hawaii. So your grandfather was one of, what, about a thousand individuals who were picked up by the FBI? Uh, uh, I, and the months yeah, after I, Pearl Harbor? I think there were, um, yes, a, a few thousand, but uh, the men from Hawaii who were sent in 10 uh, transfer boats were numbered about 700. So, what, what, um, was, what was his name, by the way? We should have his name. Oh, Reverend Thomas Akugo Atanabe. Okay. And, and before we get to more about um, what you found out about him and the book, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Uh, well, um, <laughs> I was born a year after, a little over a year after Pearl Harbor was attacked. Um, but I was basically sheltered from the war and any knowledge of my grandfather's imprisonment. Uh, so I had a relatively normal, quote, quote, <laughs> uh, childhood. <laughs> um, I started my education at, at uh, UH Manoa, and uh, then I went to Duke University in North Carolina. Um, my teaching career was uh, completely on the mainland uh, with my first teaching a job in the South, actually, um, in the Virgin Virginia tobacco country. Uh, uh, Longwood College then, uh, university now. And this was in the mid 60s. So things were very different then, um, but certainly there was a different kind of volatility. Uh, I, I was there when um, Bobby Kennedy was, Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy were both assassinated. So you've been teaching uh, most recently at Youngstown, Ohio. Yes, yes, yes. Um, actually from Virginia, I went to uh, Japan and then back to Hawaii for a while and then moved to Washington, Washington State and taught at the University of Washington um, before I went to Pennsylvania and um, uh, ended up in Ohio at Youngstown State for my uh, job, my final job before retirement. So tell us um, how much you knew about your grandfather. Had you, had you known him as a kid? And, and what did you know about him uh, uh, before you undertook this project? Well, um, we didn't see much of him because he lived on Maui. Uh, he was uh, the pastor uh, on Maui and while I was, well, I was actually growing up before he retired. Um, and so I wouldn't say that I knew him well. He, you know, we didn't spend very much time with him. And when he came to visit us, it would be for a short period. Um, so although we felt warmly towards each other, I didn't really know very much about him. And um, most of what I know, I learned really from this project. Um, I mean, I started out with biographical facts. Uh, my brother had collected some information um, so that was a good basis for my, for my, um, as a starting point. And, uh, you know, this, this told us that he had immigrated from Hiroshima uh, at age 22, that he uh, chose to, he settled in California. He went from uh, Hiroshima to Seattle and ended up in, in uh, San Francisco. 
Um, and he chose to study for the Christian ministry. He was baptized in San Francisco and chose to study uh, for the Christian ministry there. Um, he started a family. Well, I, I, I did want to show you this. So this is the um, infamous photo, the, I, the mysterious photo. And why, that was why you say mysterious. Because I didn't know exactly where it was or who these people were. Um, I'm sorry, I needed to show you this. So, so um, he started a family uh, in uh, California, uh, had a ministry in Stockton to begin with, and then um, moved to Sac Sacramento. And uh, from Sacramento, uh, he actually was recruited to go to the territory of Hawaii and ended up on Maui. So here he is in the back row with his um, Sunday school flock and others. Um, then he went to the Big Island. He was assigned by the Hawaii the Hawaiian Evangelical Association to move to Ola'a. Uh, so that was actually where he was when he was picked up. Um, but anyway, uh, I, this, this information was still relatively factual. Uh, I didn't, it wasn't very personal and intimate, uh, but I did get a glimpse of his sorrow on the loss of his two-year-old son. His um, two-year-old, well, their two-year-old son was killed in an um, accident with an oil truck. Uh, and, you know, there was not very much information, but in his pocket diary, I was able to understand something of his loss. Um, I also learned through this project um, his comfort with English. And ironically, through his hearing board interrogation, uh, because many of the Issei uh, had translators and they were offered translators uh, during uh, these, you know, the, their inter interrogations, but he felt comfortable enough with his knowledge and his um, command of English to answer the questions himself. Uh, his letters were also written by himself, although although others uh, chose to have friends or other people uh, write the, their letters for them. So the fact that he had no translator, he didn't use translators, I think, shows uh, at least his his own co uh, confidence um, with English. Um, I also learned that. Um, Let's see. Oops, sorry. I also learned that uh, he, you know, through his letters that he felt that kind of confidence. And um, he continued his ministry, um, officiating at, at services. I found that I was I was actually uh, not surprised at his faith, the, the fact that he, he um, continued to uh, practice, but he continued also to have faith in um, American democracy, despite the fact that he was um, imprisoned in the way he was. This, this also was very interesting to me um, because it showed, this is a no uh, libretto for a no play. Um, this is something that a number of, of uh, Issei in the camps uh, seem to have a lot of pleasure with. They, they continued to, uh, some of them actually um, belong to chanting societies before the war. And they continued this practice. But one of the things that I found 
so interesting was that they, um, I think they must have gotten original copies and then passed these around um, because these were written in the individual's hand. Uh, so, so this was actually copied from some other uh, libretto by my grandfather. And uh, I also found that Reverend Fujitani, uh, Kodo Fujitani, had a whole collection of um, uh, librettos that he uh, that he had also copied. So these men would would sit in um, these chanting societies, and they would you know they would um, chant together. But the, <clears throat> what was so interesting to me is that in the I believe it was in the 1970s. Uh, the late 60s and early 70s, I had not known anything about my grandfather's interest in no or his practice um, of, uh, of, the, of no chanting, but I had gotten interested in no uh, through a class that I took at, at the uh, UH. And I ended up going to Japan um, to actually learn <laughs> some dance and, and some chanting myself uh, or some song myself. And um, I, this was one of those real missed opportunities. You know, I didn't know until after he died that we had this, this common interest. So that was a, one of the sad, but, but um, interesting facts for me. You know, I, I remember having had to, in graduate school, <clears throat> um, reading some of the no plays, which were not easy to read. Uh, this, these were written, um, the original no plays, 13th, 14th, 15th centuries? Right. Um, from the, I mean, classical texts. Very, very classical, yes. So the fact that these men, um, you know, first of all, that they could read them and that they enjoyed chanting together, I thought was a real interest, a real um, kind of symbolic um, action on their part that this was a real, you know, it was a chorus. They would yeah. chant together and they would be able to, um, uh, they would be one basically, you know, and, and because I had actually uh, studied some of this, both uh, myself by learning how to do this very, very basic uh, kind of chanting, um, and because I'd watched films of it and watched the actual plays, um, I could hear the, the men in the East Bay in the camps in a way, yeah. you know, and how they would sound together as one voice. So I thought that was really symbolic um, as, a, as a means of um, surviving, really. Yeah. You know, not only they're, not only they're, um, were they, doing something that was familiar to them, but they were doing something together and that was unifying in, it, in itself. Um, but to answer your question, the most important thing for me personally that I learned in this project was my <clears throat> grandfather's involvement in my earliest years. <clears throat> I didn't know that he knew anything about me as a, as a baby. But my father apparently uh, took lots of pictures, <laughs> partly because I was his first child, but also because my grandfather, this was my grandfather's first granddaughter. Oh. I was, I mean, I was his, <laughs> my grandfather's first granddaughter. And um, so I think that was kind of a, a, a nice bond between my father and my grandfather, even mm -hmm. though they were thousands of miles away. <laughs> and um, as I read his letters, because I was born in 1942, at the end of 1942, and so he and he was um, imprisoned until 1945, November of 45 is when he returned. So during that period of time, my mother would send him pictures, and he would write back, you know, comments about um, my growth. So oh. this was. As I say, it, it was an intimate kind of knowledge that I didn't know existed, but now I do know, and and it's very it was very moving to me to yeah. learn that he that he had that uh, connection. 
you this know. was the first time you learned of this. Yes. Sounds yes. Amazing. yes. Well, you know, my recollection is that of the um, hundreds of, of individuals, there were something like 157,000 of us who were uh, Japanese Americans in Hawaii uh, at Pearl Harbor, when Pearl Harbor happened. And uh, less than a thousand individuals were, were eventually picked up. The rest, I think, were family members who were incarcerated on, on the continent. Um, but it is telling, I think, that, that the incarcerees at, uh, at a place like um, Santa Fe were reading no libretto, uh, librettos. Um, these were highly educated community leaders who were picked up. That's right. Uh, is that your impression? Oh, definitely, definitely. The, um, in fact, that was um, one of the main observations uh, that I made, or one of the main things that was affirmed for me and in my research was that um, it. I think it was kind of known that um, that these men were community leaders, but when you actually see um, what they did, you know that they were Buddhist. Buddhist priests, they were Shinto priests, they were uh, Christian clergy, um, they were very uh, educated uh, teachers, uh, school principal, Japanese school principals, uh, businessmen, very um, successful businessmen. Um, so they were, they were, they were even even people who were laborers were educated. And um, in, in one case, uh, Mr. Kinoshita uh, was, you know, he, he was a, in his uh, children's PTA. You know, he was very involved with his children's growth. So we're, we're talking about people who were leaders in different ways uh, in, at different levels of the communities. And, um, and as I think, I think, um, that they brought their education and their, you know, their sensibilities with them. So that, um, yeah, I think they, they, this was actually a different, um, I think you mentioned earlier that, that these men were um, chosen by the FBI and the military intelligence uh, people. They were selected. You know, and that, you know, in a sense, you could say, well, they were selected for certain reasons. Uh, those, those are very complicated reasons when you start looking at them. But um, I think the fact that they were selected has implications later on as well. So you start, you start by looking through the, um, <clears throat> your family records and, and the archives and going to um, commemoration events to find out more about your grandfather. But you start, in, in the book, you write about a number of other Issei, first generation um, immigrant men as well. And these are all men, were they not? Yes, yes. Uh, well, actually, though, there were eight women who were also sent um, to, the, to internment on the mainland. Mm -hmm. um, and, they were, uh, this is a whole nother question that I would like to see someone uh, investigate because, um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty, I think it would be a really interesting story to, to look at um, the, the jobs that these women had. I think they were uh, Japanese school teachers or principals or priestesses. And from, from what I could see, so, but I think this is an, an area of research that would be very interesting. Uh, otherwise, it was, you know, pre they were all men and they were all sent uh, to these male only camps. Um, and I found that, uh, you know, my, I, I started out really with the idea that I was just going to look at my grandfather's and his experience. Uh, in fact, I was um, at the Smithsonian w working with you when I started my research. And thanks to your introduction um, to Eiko and Jack Herzig, um, you know, I learned how to navigate the National Archives. 
And um, I don't think that would have been such an easy process had it not been for them because they really kind of gave me a tutoring session uh, the first time I met them. But I was able to find five files on uh, Reverend Watanabe. At that point, it took me weeks and weeks, in fact, months of, of um, work in the archives, but I was able to find five files. And, and actually that could have been the end of the, the research process, you know? I, yeah needed to find about find out what happened to him and that I found the five files. Uh, so I could have um, just sort of stopped with that. But the problem is that there were many gaps in the narrative of what happened to him. You know, um, he, he, I couldn't find any journals of his uh, or diaries of his. And um, the, the documents, of course, were very selected. You know, there were lots of them, hundreds of pages, but in the five files, but um, they didn't give a whole narrative. So while I was working in the archives, basically more doors started to open for me um, because I found hundreds of other Hawaii Issei files. And I mean, this was no great discovery. With the, his file was among these hundreds of other Issei files. And, uh, but I also met a few people whose relatives had been interned, you know, just by chance. And um, so I decided to move from a single biography to a, um, to a communal biography at that point. Oh, I, and I did find out this that this was Barrack 64 at the Santa Fe internment camp. But I didn't, I, I will never know um, really how he had changed. This is, this is one of my regrets. I will never know how he really changed. And I'm sorry, I, I got a little distracted here, so... Um, these are the five record record groups, or the f four record groups, but the five files that I found. And um, what was what was fortunate in in this? Sorry, was that um, I found all of these files of the of these um, Issei men. And I decided to move from a single, the single biography to a collective biography, but then I had to find the families um, in Hawaii, which is another story, of course, and that, that was a slow process. But fortunately, um, the JCCH, the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii staff was organizing parallel research. They had been uh, working on the beginnings of the Honolulu Uli research, I believe. And um, uh, they had events, one of them called the Dark Clouds Over uh, Paradise. It was a series of, of different um, uh, talks and so on. And because of that, they were raising attention to questions of justice in terms of this, this particular part of the incarceration. Um, and then 55 years later, of course, um, it was hard to find people. Uh, it, it wasn't like, you know, they were just available uh, easily. But um, thanks to others, I was able to talk to a few Issei. Um, the Nisei were for, forthcoming. Some were very, forth, when, were very forthcoming, more than willing, uh, and gave me many materials. Um, so the, the, there's really referrals um, at, and I, I gave a number of talks and eat, at each event um, when I shared what I had learned uh, in Honolulu or the Big Island or Maui, there were very often interning families in the audience and um, some would or more than one person might come forward uh, to talk with me. So it was a really, you know, um, it evolved as a community uh, research project in many ways. And, and I did want to 
at least um, share with you of four, four people to begin with. Uh, as I said, there were many, many moving stories. I talked to over 40 family members, internees and family members. Um, but the four internees themselves, um, this is Reverend Shingetsu Akahoshi, who was in his 80, 90s when I met him in Virginia. Uh, he was a Buddhist minister and an artist whom I actually um, had a time to, to talk with um, in, a, in an interview. Um, and I, I learned that he actually remembered my grandfather. He was the only, actually of all the Issei that I talked to, I didn't talk to that many Issei, but I mean, of the Issei I talked to, he was the only one who had personal, a personal rec rec uh, recollection of my grandfather, which I do relate in the book, but he was an artist and, and um, did Western style paintings as, as you can see here. Um, but he also did Japanese style paintings. And um, in this case, he uh, did the painting when, while uh, Reverend uh, Fujitani uh, did the calligraphy. So this was probably from uh, the Santa Fe internment camp. Gail, what, what happened to the paintings? Well, um, this painting is in the possession of the Fujitani family. And I believe uh, these two paintings are in the possession of uh, Akoshi Sensei's family. Wow. Okay. So the, another, another uh, Issei who was very helpful to me was Reverend Matsuura. Um, he was also in his 90s, uh, was a Buddhist minister, uh, eventually became the bishop of Soto Mission in Honolulu. Um, and remember that the government, the US government considered clergy to be security risks, uh, high security risks. Uh, and so they rounded them all up, the, the Buddhists and the um, Shinto priests especially, but there were others as well. Um, but, but the interesting, thing about uh, Reverend Matsuura, now you can see him here, is that he had a wife and baby, a very, a, a very young baby, and his censored letters to his wife reveal the real pain of family separation, what is called today, we call family separation. But I think his letters more than many other letters revealed that pain uh, and that, that anxiety, the constant anxiety of being separated from family. I found a number of letters uh, from different families that, that reflected that. You know, can you say something about wh why, why, why did officials censor these letters? I mean, these guys were in prison. Well, they weren't anywhere near um, defense installations. They could, they, they constituted no threat? What, what was going on? Well, um, apparently uh, they had a list of things that you weren't supposed, they were not supposed to write about or make allusion to and so on. So, um, it, you know, if they crossed certain lines, I guess um, the censors would cut out and you can see that they, you know, they either cut out lines as, as in the case of this letter here, or whole paragraphs in the case of this letter. And, and that was the, the other thing about the letter writing is that to begin with, they were only allowed to write in English, which was very hard for the Issei wow. because there were those who uh, really uh, could not write in English. They did, some of them took classes, you know, so that they started to learn English but um, basically that was not comfortable for them. Mm -hmm. And you know, these, the anguish that they were feeling, they couldn't express in this foreign language. Mm -hmm. um, so it was very difficult for them. I think this was 
one of the um, greatest causes of anxiety was being able to communicate with their families uh, through somebody else. And uh, then eventually, because the Geneva Convention, I believe, um, said that you should be able to write, you know, communicate in your own language. Um, so it was after a, a certain amount of time that the government then allowed the say to uh, write in Japanese. And uh, yet, if they went, you know, if they wrote about the wrong, wrong things, then they got to, you know, this whole section, the whole paragraph cut out. But um, Reverend Matsuura had hundreds of letters. I mean, I, the family had kept letters between him and his, and his wife. Uh, and there were, there were really the boxes, you know, <laughs> there's a whole box of oh. letters. Um, but I was also very honored to have his painting um, of the Santa Fe camp on the cover of my book. So I was very happy that uh, the family allowed me to, uh, oh. to use that. So this was a, an interesting painting because um, I actually found the same uh, outline in another set of colors from another family. Um, so my, this is why I use the term rendered, that it was the, because I think it may have, there, there may have been an art class of some sort where um, different internees sort of interpreted, you know, the, the uh, scene in terms of their own experience. But it, anyway, um, Reverend Matsuura's painting I thought was really lovely and, and um, pictured in many ways, it pictured the isolation of the camp itself. Um, now, Reverend Ohara, Kenjo Ohara, um, was one of the youngest Buddhist ministers who was picked up. He was actually maybe the most recent arrival to the islands at the time. Um, and he wasn't on the FBI list. So he tells the story of um, the FBI coming for his, the um, senior monk, I mean, excuse me, the senior uh, priest and, um, and asking who he was. And Reverend Ohara gave him his name. And so the guy writes his name down. And then a few days later, they came to pick him up. Um, so he, <laughs> he could, if he hadn't been so honest, I suppose, he may have um, escaped that, um, but he was, uh, he tells an interesting story of being interrogated uh, and the interrogator constantly asking him if he's a spy. And he says, no, no, I'm not a spy. And um, he gave the same answer over and over and over again, so that apparently someone um, who was transporting him or something, said, why don't you just say you're a spy? And he says, he says no, I'm not a spy. Well, you know, someone like me would never be a spy. You know, th there's no relationship between the two jobs. <laughs> and, uh, and he says, and why would they want someone like me who doesn't even speak English to be a spy? <laughs> so, you know, he, he was uh, really quite an interesting uh, character, but, but he, uh, as the, a minister, um, also, uh, you know, was respected and treated with respect. Uh, here he is with uh, Reverend uh, Kuchiba, who eventually also became a, a bishop. And he officiated at these huge funerals. Uh, this this is another story which I wow. won't have time to talk about, but um, anyway, he, you can see that he was among all of these Buddhist priests. And so, the, you know, this really shows you how many of them were affected by the roundup. And these were, of course, not only Buddhist priests from Hawaii, but also from the mainland. So this this that photograph you just showed, Gail, yes. showed a, a, a Nisei second generation American-born citizen soldier. 
Yes. Probably in the 442nd Regimental Combat yes. Team? Probably. Vis vis visiting his father in, in Santa Fe? Is, no, in this case, his father had passed away. Uh -huh. His father had passed away, um, Nizo Nishizaki, and the son was called to attend the funeral. Uh, but but um, as I will mention later, um, I found that there were many sons who visited their fathers, and there were also those who were killed in action, and I was going to mention that a little bit uh, later in our discussion. Okay. But um, this is Mr. Matsumoto, uh, Kazumi Matsumoto, um, who was really um, an interesting person. He was a store clerk uh, on Kauai and, um, before the war and um, had a, just a ton of photos as well as interests. I mean, he, he had many photos because he had many interests. Um, and one of the things that I thought was so uh, interesting about him was that he really epitomized the ways, the, the different ways that the Issei resisted what they called barbed wire disease. You know, the, the, this was a term that Mr. Hirano one of the people uh, um, whose son I interviewed called this uh, malaise, I think, you know, that, that comes from imprisonment and boredom and, and um, uh, agitation and, you know, the, the whole uh, experience of imprisonment and the aggravation and the um, insult of, in, of um, incarceration that so they called it barbed wire disease and they had all kinds of ways of coping with it. And Mr. Matsunomoto seemed to have, uh, in many ways, he, he participated in, in many of these things. So at Fort Missoula, for example, he was on a baseball team or softball team. I'm, I'm not sure which it was. I think it was, well, anyway. So they were champs at Missoula um, and he, so he was athletic at the same time that he um, was, a, was an actor. So he played the part of uh, the, the onagata, the, the female uh, in, it was very typical, right, of Japanese theater. Um, but here he is as a, a woman, playing the part of a woman. And you can see from this from this photo how elaborate their um, costuming was. You know, they they spent hours and hours creating these costumes, and they, uh, they created these costumes from scratch. Apparently, you know, they may have gotten something sent to them, but they <clears throat> they um, made their their own costumes and as well as, you know, you can see the wigs here. Um, I mean, it was really quite, quite incredible to see how creative they were. And these were, these theater performances were very popular. They were considered even more popular than uh, the, the movies. Uh, and then, you know, they had them at, at scheduled times of the, of the uh, evenings usually. And, um, you know, people would, go all out <laughs> to attend them. But he also was very creative with his hands um, and told me that he had learned this craft of plating uh, in Hiroshima when he was a child. But when he was at Camp Livingston, Louisiana, the, which was a, a, a very different um, environment, right, from, from the, the desert, um, they had longleaf pine needles or, or pine trees, excuse me, they had longleaf pine trees there. And so he would collect uh, the pine needles and somehow, mm -hmm. I don't know how, uh, flatten them and braid them into these kinds of um, strips and then stitch them into these purses. Wow. So these are stitched. <clears throat> 
cut wove it, stitched. And this really is the size of a small briefcase, this one here. Um, so I, I just found it in, uh, extraordinary that they would be able to do these kinds of things, these laborious you know, tasks, but, but it gave them so much pleasure as well as satisfaction, I think. Um, yeah, to be able to, sorry to so what happens to these kinds of artifacts? These things belong in like museums or historical centers? Hopefully, um, these happen to be in my possession. Oh. Um, yes, these happen to be in my possession. He did give them to me and um, I am hoping to find a home for them. Um, but, but, you know, they, I found them in other families. <laughs> So, so either he taught other people or others knew how to do this kind of, um, you know, this kind of crafts work. And um, I, I was just uh, quite amazed, partly because of my own interest in, in uh, crafts and folk art, but that they would be able to produce um, these kinds of, uh, of artifacts. And, and, you know, th these kinds of things are, are uh, quite, um, fragile, you know, as with age, they become quite fragile. So they need to be uh, taken care of very, very carefully. And I'm, I am concerned that families don't realize, you know, the value of these, uh, these kinds of artifacts. I'm hoping that there will be people who will uh, recognize them and donate them to museums and so on. Um, but I did want to mention that that he also um, made his own shakuhachi. Unfortunately, uh, he offered to show it, the shakuhachi he made to me. And unfortunately at the time I had to catch a plane. So I couldn't, I couldn't see that. And, and um, the great sadness for me is that um, he got sick after, you know, sometime after I left. And um, and he passed away. So, Shakuhachi is a Jam Japanese bamboo flute. Yes, yes. But apparently, they had groups again of people who who were interested in the shakuhachi, um, yeah. made their own, and and played together. As I understand it, I have a photo of him with with the, the shakuhachi. Uh, so, so um, you know, with all this information that I was collecting, I needed the sort of a narrative glue to tie the stories together in some way. Um, and luckily, I found that um, Mr. Kato, I, I wanted to show, share this with you, Mr. Kato, oops, here, um, who was a coffee farmer had an amazing memory and he kept a detailed journal and then 167 letters home. Uh, and these were translated by his wife and daughter. So they had this for the family and they shared it with me. And this you know, was part of that narrative that I was able to, to put together. Um, then Mr. Kawasaki was the, uh, the person, this person here, sorry, timing. Oh. Mr. Kawasaki here um, was an attorney and he was also a camp leader. Uh, so he kept detailed notes in a scrapbook. And in English, <laughs> uh, both he was very fluent in English. He has an interesting story in himself, but uh, he had notes in Japanese and English, but predominantly in English. So um, between Mr. Kawasaki's uh, notes in his uh, scrapbook and Mr. Uh, Kato's uh, journal entries and his letters, you know, I was able to, to kind of get a sense of what actually happened to them. And the interesting, other interesting thing is that um, 
this they were on the same transfer boat as my grandfather. So uh, these are the men from uh, the same transfer boat I gathered. I had to kind of put several uh, pieces of information together because it wasn't labeled, but um, I gathered because all of these men were on the same transfer boat that this is this photo was of the men on the, on the transfer boat. And um, uh, that's why I knew, I kind of know what happened to my grandfather because they can, both kept such good records. And, you know, I was able to, to kind of draw a, a line, a narrative line from that. Okay. <laughs> I think you can, I think we can go to the next question now. Sorry, I'm, okay. my slides are a little mixed up. Oh, no, no, no that's fine. Those, those are great photographs and, and um, help us understand who these people were, what they, what they went through. Um, so as far as, you know, I, it may be worth reiterating at this point um, that these, so these are people picked up um, according to the federal government after executive order 9066 issued by Franklin Roosevelt um, because they were considered threats to national security. But in fact, um, the, J. Edgar Hoover uh, was one of the people who testified on behalf of the FBI that he thought that there was no need to incarcerate people en masse. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, it's, and it seems to defy, uh, it seems to be counterintuitive in, in any case that only uh, a s several hundred um, people from Hawaii were incarcerated, which is the point of attack from the Japanese Imperial Navy and 120 and 110, 15,000 people on the West Coast who are 2,000 miles separated from, from the point of attack were um, incarcerated, forcibly removed en masse. It doesn't, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't seem to make sense, but. Um, right, I, I, I think the, um, you know, the fact that the government was really, um, I mean, I think this was a plan before Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of evidence that this plan uh, existed before Pearl Harbor, you know, and because these men were picked up, many of them were picked up on December 7th. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was picked up on December 7th, so was uh, Kato, Mr. Kato, so was Mr. Kawasaki. You know, many of these people were on a list and they were picked up. Some, uh, my guess is that even as Pearl Harbor was being bombed. Yeah. So there was a, this, this it was, was premeditated. Yeah, this is extraordinary. Um, great book, um, Remembering Our Grandfather's Exile. I see, I see Roger um, has joined us. So I think we're probably at the end of the hour. Oh my God. Is that about right, Roger? Yes, um, I'm afraid so but it's been fascinating um, and it's a really interesting sequel to, to a panel we had just a couple of days ago with Tom Kaufman. Yes. Uh, which is kind of the other side of the same coin. <clears throat> uh, anyway, I found this deeply interesting. And ironically, the, ver the next panel is, is about a, a detective story writer who sets his stories in 1950s Hawaii at the time when the Japanese uh, Americans came to the fore politically. So um, it's just a coincidence, um, but an interesting one. Okay. Well, thank you. I'll be sure to watch that. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I think uh, that was a really valuable contribution and much appreciated. And, Thank uh, you. Across so many time zones, but <laughs> virtually it doesn't seem to matter. Thank you so much. Aloha. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Franklin. Thank you. Thank you, Gail.